Good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening everyone. We have a truly international audience with us today and it's great to have everyone on board. I am Janet Remington of the University of York and I'm delighted to be convening this panel to shine more light on the inimitable Black South African, British South African um, writer and broadcaster Noni Jabavu. I will go on shortly to introduce our panelists and to outline the structure of our event today. But first I'm charged with covering a few technical notes. If you are watching live, you could ask questions of the speakers using the uh, Q&A button on your, on your screen. Should you have any technical issues, such as the loss of Wi-Fi, you can rejoin the event using the original link. I should note that today's event is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch again on YouTube. Subtitles are available in this event. To turn these off or on, use the CC Live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. So now onto the outline of our event and the excellent panel of speakers who are fittingly both from the UK and South Africa, given the flows and twos and fro's of Noni Jabavi's life. At the outset, I must thank the panelists and the supporters um, for all the research and collaboration building up to this event. And I'm very excited about the archival material that we've been able to uncover as part of it. So we will start off uh, by um, hearing from writer and scholar Makosa Zana Klaba, also known as Kosi, from the University of the Vedvatis Rund in South Africa. Kosi is a do doyen of Noni Jabavu studies and also her biographer. She will give us an overview of Noni's life and how she came from South Africa to be in York. We will then move on to dig into really fascinating archival detail about Noni's years in York as a teenager. Charles Fonge, a university archivist at the Borthwick Institute at the University of York, and Sarah Moore, archivist and librarian at the Mount School York, will explore what life was like in this leading Quaker school in the 1930s. And our final speaker will be scholar and writer Atambile Musola of the University of Pretoria in South Africa. She does leading work on the intellectual histories of black, of black women. Atambile will reflect on a few key themes arising from the panel such as the complexities of identity and belonging, lives on the move and girls' education. And then we'll end with addressing a few questions from the audience. And I very much look forward to our discussion today. We're going to move on now to hear from, from Kosi Kaba. Thank you for <clears throat> coming through. And thank you, Janet, for inviting me to participate at this uh, festival. So I'd like to start with a question that a lot of people ask me, which is why did you get interested in Noni when and how? It's interesting because I was just at a secondhand bookstore in Johannesburg. I love secondhand bookstores. And I found her first book drawn in color on the shelf. And as I was reading the back of the book, I thought, I am such a reader, how come I've never heard of this person? So I bought the book and started reading it. And what was interesting for me about reading that book was that it was the first time I'd ever read a book that gave me a sense of who my parents would have been when they were younger. I don't know about you, but you know, when you're a child and growing up, your parents are just your parents. You're not interested in their young lives. And that it was almost as if Noni was a reflection of my parents. So that was interesting. And so the book stayed next to my bed for a very, very long time. So fast forward to 2002, 
I get an email saying Noni is coming back to South Africa. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I had read the book and just assumed that she had died because I had read that she was born in 1919. So to cut that story short, Noni returns to South Africa in May, 2002. And two years later, I'm doing my master's at Wits University and it was a master's on creative writing. And one of the things we had to do in the first semester was to write the life, a day in the life of dot, 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 dot. So this was by a professor was doing biography. So I remember thinking back to the day when Noni had come back and I couldn't be at the airport because she was coming back from Harare via Johannesburg to East London. I was traveling when she was in South Africa on the day she returned and I couldn't be there. And then for the first time, I thought, just go back there, a day in the life of. It was doing that research that made me realize that I wasn't the only one who didn't know much about Noni because at that time she was, was Google around in 2002. You couldn't find anything about her online. Instead, you found information on her father and her grandfather. So that's how my, my interest started because everywhere I went, this library, these newspapers, she just seemed to me like she had disappeared. So that's how I started being interested. So let me go through the slides then. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, because I thought to talk about Noni, I could just speak forever. So I limited my talk today to two things, what I'm calling the peripatetic print of her life because she wrote about how, she wrote about the peripatetic print of her feet. And it was, it's just an expression that I love because it represents who she became. So she was born in 1919 on the 20th of August in Alice. And remember, this is the third year when after the University of Fort Hare had started. Her father, Didi T. Jababu, a lecturer, is a lecturer with uh, Alexandra Kerr when the university starts. So she's born in Alice in a university town. And when she writes about that time, she talks about how the world was at her doorstep because this was the first big university for black people in the continent. And a lot of people were coming from the continent to Fort Hay. And of course it was a university that was making history. So there, were a, there was a lot of movement at Noni's home. She just met the world at her doorstep. The world was in her kitchen. The world was in her lounge as she grows up. And then she leaves in March of 1933. She lives with a family, she leaves South Africa with a couple and their children. And the couple are Margaret Clark and Arthur Gillet. Now the Clarks are known for the shoes and the Gillets are known for the razors. It's a very interesting way for me of remembering who they were. So I became interested in who, who were they really beyond what they are known for in this public sphere. So it turns out that Margaret Clark was a very good friend of Jan Smuts, I found out. And Jan Smuts was a very good friend of uh, Noni's father. So the couple offered to be her foster parents when she goes to the Mount School in York. And so that's how she went and left with them in, in, in March of 1933 and lived with a family in Oxford. By this time, the family had three children, two boys and a girl, and she became the fourth. So she would move between Oxford and York to go to school and come back to Oxford as home. Now, she clearly did live in more than Oxford and York, but I put in Birmingham because come World War II, She's involved in, in the way that women were, were recruited to work in the factories that were manufacturing arms for war. But then thereafter, she goes to Birmingham University and she spent some time there. I haven't quite pinned the time down yet. 
And then in one of her writings, she talks about her home in Buckingham Palace, which is why I wrote it there, because I'm hoping I'll be able to check down the exact times. And I've put London there because that is where <clears throat> The Strand magazine was resuscitated on Fleet Street and she became the editor starting her work in September of 1961, but the first edition then came out in December. So she spent some time as the editor making history by becoming the first black woman, the first person who hadn't been born in the UK to edit the newspaper. Now, of course, in South Africa, as I have said, she was born in, in Alice. Her parents later built a home in Metal Drift. But when she visited in 1976, she spent some time at the university, the university currently known as Rhodes. She spent some time in Cape Town and she spent some time in Johannesburg. And of course, in her memoirs, she writes about a lot of other places in South Africa, which I didn't um, list here. So in Uganda, she lands in 1955 with her then husband because her sister had been married to a Ugandan person, but they end up staying there until 1960. And then in the, in, in the 60s, she lived in Kenya and she was living in Zimbabwe in the 80s until she came back to South Africa in 2002. When she left the Strand magazine, she went to live in Jamaica with her husband, but she also writes about a lot of other islands in the Caribbean and Trinidad being one of them. She traveled a lot. And in some of her writings, she mentioned France, Switzerland and Italy more than once, which is why they're there. Similarly with Latin America, but I remember reading how she spent some time in Mexico while she was writing her second book. And of course she was in the USA, in Canada and many other travels. I have just put the ones that seemed memorable to me as I was reading, but the reason USA is important, I will come back to that when I talk about her outputs is because she actually did a road trip which was launching her second book in the USA. However, I still haven't been able to track down all the towns, cities, states where she launched her book. And then she died in 2008 back in South Africa. So when she left Zimbabwe, she went straight into an old age home. Well, they call it an, a frail care center in East London. So could I move on to the next slide then, Charles? So in this slide, I wanted to just share the chronology of her writerly and creative outputs. And I do want to add that it's not everything, but it's the key, key ones. It was interesting for me to read about how her very first show at BBC Radio was in 1942 and in January but she kept doing this on and off until 1963. That's what the record says. And this, would, this becomes very interesting when you consider what the BBC was about in, in, in those times and what it meant to have um, black people on radio and the roles that they took on. One of the interesting programs that she did, because over these years she did quite a number, one of the interesting ones that she did early on was the one on women singers, women musicians, and she chose jazz musicians. Yeah, so that was her life at the BBC. She did quite a range. So in 1960, she becomes known as a writer because of the book Drawn in Color, which she started writing in 1955 when she came to South Africa because her brother, the only brother, had died. So Drawn in Color is a memoir of her visit to South Africa in 1955. This book then gets published, so it's published first in London and then gets published in the US by St. Martin's Press. I've spoken about the time in New Strand. And then interestingly, in 1962, it gets translated into Italian. I still wish to hold the copy in my hands. I'm still trying to track it down. 
but yeah. And then in 1963, she writes what I call a sequel to the drawn, to drawn in Color, because it's also a memoir about her travels in South Africa. And then come 1976, when she's living in Kenya, she decides, she's, she, has, she had decided then to start writing a biography of her father. And so she comes to South Africa, she's doing some preliminary research, interviewing people, goes back to Kenya, and then comes back to, for a longer stay in 1977. And then she's invited to write a weekly column for the Daily Dispatch newspaper, which was based at, in East London. And the columns were called Noni on Wednesdays. So, it's a very interesting set of columns, uh, the way she writes about what it was like to be in South Africa after so many years of being away. And yeah, so they're very interesting read. And it was only in 1982 that her book, The Orca People was published in South Africa by a South African publisher. This book too, had been issued in the USA by St. Martin's Press. The South African version is a very small book. It's got a soft cover, whereas the John Murray books have a hard cover and they're thick with thick spines. And as a book lover, it's just interesting for me to watch what publishers choose, how they choose to present books. Okay, so then 1980 and 19 to 1987, I got a few writings of hers in the Herald newspaper. And unlike the columns that she wrote for the Daily Dispatch newspaper, it was, um, what shall I call them? Just articles when she was responding to what was happening in Zimbabwe rather than the columns with their consistency week after week. Now, I know for sure that Noni wrote other things uh, that are not published, one of them being the biography of her father. I read somewhere to a, in a letter that she wrote to somebody that she was close to finishing it. Uh, she was also working on her own autobiography and she wrote to friends about how difficult it was to reflect on her life and write about it. Whether that was finished, I am not sure yet. And whether it's sitting somewhere in somebody's desk, I am not sure yet. But I'm quite aware of the fact that she wrote quite a lot. And as we're preparing for this festival, I learned that she was writing even in the 30s when she was at York. That got me very excited. So I think I'll end there for now. It's a pleasure to join you for this event and to talk about the archives and on his time in York and to present with Sarah, who'll give us some background to the Mount School and insights into life there in the 1930s. At the Borthwick Institute, we're fortunate in having um, several appearances of Nonny in the archives, which includes, as uh, Coase has just said, some of her earliest published pieces. Nonny came to Britain in 1933, age 13, and she was first placed briefly at Sibford School in Oxfordshire before coming to the Mount School in York in September 1934. The archives of the Mount School are held at the Borthwick and date back to the school's 18th century origins. Among the registers, reports, student magazines and correspondence, we can discern Nonny's footprints in the documentary paper trails of the school records that chart her time there. The records give insights into the Quaker network that supported and funded her place, her completion of the school certificate, her parents' ambitions, and early evidence of her literary interest and talent. Nonny also reappears in the Borthwick's archives 40 years later. In 1974, the university's former Centre for Southern African Studies began a project to collect publications and archives relating to Southern Africa. The initiative was the idea of another transnational creative, Dennis Brutus, the African poet and anti-apartheid activist. Brutus had been exiled from South Africa following his release from prison on Robben Island in 1966. 
he kick-started York's Southern African collections by depositing some of his own literary manuscripts and political papers around campaigns to eliminate racism in sport. The director of York Centre for Southern African Studies visited Noni um, in Nairobi later on in 1974, and it was following that visit that Noni offered copies of some of her family's early photographs, as well as the text of her 1953 testimony to the United Nations Commission um, on the racial situation in South Africa. One of the photographs that Noni donated to the university was this one of her parents' wedding in 1916. Her father, David Sundon Tengo Jabavu, who was the first black professor at Fort Hare University College and had studied previously in the UK at Birmingham University, is seen here seated next to his new wife, Tap Florence Tandizwa, who was to found the Zenzeli Women's Self-Improvement Association. Davidson's stepmother is to his side and Tandizwa's mother to hers. Noni's grandfather, John Tengo Jabavu, stands behind the bride and he was the first black South African to own and edit a newspaper in the Cape. The family had a long-standing connection to the Quaker movement. Joseph Rowntree had visited Noni's grandfather and his newspaper in 1901. He also donated money when the newspaper was shut down by the British colonial government during the Anglo-Boer War. John Tengo was accepted as a Quaker in 1912. And the Westminster Monthly Meeting of the Society of Friends also supported Nonny's father, DDT, during his studies in Birmingham. Nonny was born three years after this photograph. Her education started at Lovedale, a South African missionary school in the Eastern Cape, whose alumni include other prominent figures such as Nelson Mandela and Steve Biko. She came to study in York in the sorry uh, yeah in the UK in 1933, first at Sibford, and then from 1934 to the 36 at another Quaker school, the Mount in York. The Mount School York, originally the York Quarterly Meeting Friends Girls School, was begun in 1785 by Esther Tuke, assisted by her husband William Tuke, the founder of York's Retreat Hospital. The school reopened in Castlegate in 1831 and ran there until 1857, when it moved to its current site. The school also numbers some very distinguished people among its old scholars, including Dame Judy Dench, Elfrida Vipont, and Dame Margaret Drabble. The school's ethos reflects the Quaker values of simplicity, truth, equality, peace, social justice and sustainability. These Quaker values are central to our school community. We value each member equally and this results in a happy, caring community. Girls learn to see the best in everyone, to discover the best in themselves and others and want to make a positive difference in the world. Girls learn to articulate their thoughts and listen to others. All girls attend regular meetings, a little bit similar to assemblies, where pupils and staff come together. Here, everyone has an equal voice and the opportunity to speak. Meetings include a period of silence in the Quaker style, and this provides a chance for the girls to reflect and gather their thoughts. The Mount School in the 1930s was an integral part of York's Quaker community. The girls were introduced to established Quakers such as Arnold Roundtree. Bootham boys and Mount girls who were practicing Quakers were also encouraged to meet and marry. Ellen Waller was headmistress in the 1930s. Ellen was passionate about connecting the girls with the world outside the school. There was continued expansion of the school buildings the construction of a new assembly hall come theatre in 1931 marked the school's centenary and new classrooms and laboratories were built in 1935. During the centennial celebrations, pupils dressed to represent the uniforms of earlier decades. Ellen Waller also introduced Civics Week for girls not doing public exams. 
A week of outings, activities and visiting speakers were organised. The theme changed every year and examples included local government, famous women and the child of today. Girls visited local businesses and shops to see workers in action. They visited power stations and waterworks and attended city council meetings. The girls were educated to become responsible citizens and to train as social workers, doctors and teachers. There was no corporal punishment at the school, just medi, which meant you had to meditate about your actions. There were 111 Mount Scholars when Noni Jabavu joined. Scholars came from all walks of life, as well as noted families, such as the Cadburys, Crossfields, Roundtrees, and the Clarks of Shu fame. And Noni went on to marry filmmaker Michael Cadbury Crossfield in 1951. As part of the daily routine at the school, girls would learn a short text from the Bible and recite this at breakfast every morning. At the school meeting on Friday, these texts would be collated. And on Sundays, the older girls went to the Quaker meeting house for their Quaker meeting, which was held jointly with Bootham. After breakfast, the girls would make their beds and were not allowed to be in their bedrooms again until the end of the day. Bedrooms were for mixed ages and the older girls were responsible for looking after the younger ones. They didn't have much privacy, there were no cubicles and bath nights were in a long washroom. At lunch times, there was a seating plan and all had to observe silent grace. Table manners were strict and sign language was used if for example, you wanted to ask for things like condiments. The head wrote important daily news on a big blackboard in the central hall to keep the girls informed of current affairs. The girls were able to study a variety of subjects, including science, literature, maths, languages, economics, politics, and social sciences. The girls also played tennis, cricket, netball and hockey, and participated in matches against other schools. Quakers didn't believe in music in schools, but by the 1930s, joint plays and music productions with Bootham School and peripatetic music lessons were introduced. The Mount girls also used Bootham swimming pool and girls looked forward to their visits to Bootham, which provided the perfect opportunity to pass notes to boys. For recreation, the girls could go for walks on a Sunday afternoon and in the evenings they could read and occasionally there was a visiting speaker. The girls would be given jobs to do, such as assisting in the library and cleaning offices. And there was a rota and everyone, including Nonnie, had a set task. In an extract from her annual report, the headmistress provides more insights into Civics Week, describing it thus. Visits to the waterworks, the blind school, the cocoa works and William Session printing works interested them greatly. And not a few realized for the first time through Mrs. Crichton's delightful introductory talk, something of the work which they may later be able to do in various departments of civic life. She also closes her description with the following reflection. We realise that it is only by close cooperation between home and school that the work which we are attempting can go forward with success. The work that is of helping the girls to develop into women fitted in body, mind and spirit to serve the community as many Mount girls have served it in the past. Nonny started the Mount in September 1934 and was admitted as a member of the Society of Friends. And while her parents' names are recorded in the admissions register, it's the Oxford address of her UK guardians, Arthur and Mary Gillett. Arthur Gillett was on the board of Barclays Bank and was the nephew of Joseph Roundtree and a trustee of the Roundtree Charitable Trust in York. His wife, 
born Mary Clark, was a botanist and social reformer who'd advocated for women who'd been retained in concentration camps set up by the British during the Anglo-Boer War. She also later helped found what was to become Oxfam. As Cozy said, she was a lifelong friend of the South African statesman Jan Christian Smuts, and it was in Smuts' house in the Cape where Nonny, quote, shook hands with the English couple who were to be my guardians in England. It was Arthur Gillett who secured the bursaries to cover Nonny's tuition fees and support her studies. Moreover, their daughter Helen was also headed for the Mount and was to be one of six others who shared Nonny's dormitory in the first term. And we see Nonny there with, with Arthur Gillett. Nonny was studying for her certificate in education at the Mount, a predecessor of the GCSE. Her subjects included maths, English and English literature, history, biology, French and music. Reports note that she was a gifted musician and learning both the violin and piano, and that while she was too young to decide on a career, it was hoped that she might study medicine at Birmingham to meet a need for African women doctors. A career in medicine was not to be. When she successfully matriculated and left the Mount, age 16, and she's pictured here in the 1936 uh, class of Leavers, biology was actually Nonis weakest subject. Rather, she excelled in music, her strongest academic subject, and was later to study at London's Royal Academy of Music. She also showed a strong aptitude, of course, for English language and literature. Perhaps most intriguing, however, in terms of Nonis later writing advocacy and travel, are the speakers the Mount Girls had access to during Nonis time there. The journalist, Vernon Bartlett, spoke to the students on politics and his interviews with Hitler and Mussolini. The German Jewish pacifist, Martha Steinitz, talked on the No More War movement and its attempts to prevent another world war. There were topical talks by experts on the current state of affairs in India and the position of the Jews in the modern world. And conservationist and writer, Grey Owl, who presented himself as an indigenous American, but after his death was found to be from Sussex, gave a presentation on wildlife conservation. There were also musical recitals, a mock parliament and elections, and a trip to Haworth, home of the Bronte sisters. Nonny was actively involved in the school's literary society. This was a student-led society that had recently been revived. Respective members had to sit a writing test and were accepted only on merit. Most excitingly, she contributed three pieces to the Literary Society's magazine which was named The White Cow. It seemed to compete with the Mount magazine, whose editor of the time lamented that The White Cow was attracting more submissions. Her first two submissions, written while at school and published in 1936, comprise a short piece of creative writing titled A Seal, and she had also penned an imaginary chapter to be added to Goldsmith's 18th century novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. Her third contribution is the most interesting and resonant of her later work and style. It was submitted and published in 1937, nearly a year after Nonny had left the Mount. Called The Return, Nonny reflects on her return trip to South Africa. She describes the fact that her younger brother and sister, who'd been five and seven when she left, and are pictured here while she was away in England, now, quote, seemed very long-legged and strange at eight and ten years. The return intriguingly anticipates the opening of her first memoir, Drawn in Colour, published by John Murray in 1960, which narrates her later journey from London back to South Africa as an adult. The circumstances of this later visit were tragic. As her memoir recounts, she returned to attend her brother's funeral. He had been shot by gangsters in Johannesburg shortly before finishing his medical degree. He was only 26 years old. In her account for The White Cow, she describes the anticipation of heading back to South Africa after three years away at school in the UK, the joy of seeing her family again, the shock of losing some understanding of her home language, Isikosa, feelings of foreignness in her own land, and a consciousness of the colour bar that prevailed in the country. She ends with this reflection. Now, Having been back eight months, I feel as if I'd never been out of the country, so thoroughly at home do I feel in our brown, barren and drought-stricken wastes with its dusty roads. 
and most of all at being amidst our hospitable and laughter loving race once more. And I've just added in a few references to the Mount School archives and Nonis photographs and papers at the Borthwick, um, and also to the excellent history of the Mount School by Sarah Shields, um, and who would like to record our thanks and, and acknowledge for, for her information on the Mount School in the 1930s. Thanks, Charles um, and Sarah for all those wonderful images. Um, and thanks to Corsi as well for just painting a picture of um, Noni's wonderful life. Um, I thought I would share my reflections and just tie the threads of what's been presented already by perhaps talking about my connections or entry points into coming across or meeting Noni in the archive. Um, I was still a student in um, 2008 and 2009 when I first started writing for the Daily Dispatch which is the same newspaper that Noni wrote for when she was in South Africa um, in 1977. And it was while I was writing for the Daily Dispatch that I became aware of my own reading in a sense of where were black women being published um, and where were, they, where, were they, where were they publishing their work, but where were they in the public sphere in a sense, because my own education, I hadn't read any black woman. Um, I hadn't come across Noni in my primary school. I hadn't come across Noni in my high school or even in oh um or even in my um sorry I hope people could hear me um or even in my university undergrad and so finding out that there was a black woman who had been writing in the newspaper in 1977 gave me such um a breath of fresh air it gave me an ability to kind of read and see the world in different ways and this was while I was within proximity to all the places that Noni would have been. So I was a student in what is now Makanda, then Grandstown at Rhodes University, currently known, the university currently known as Rhodes. But also I had grown up in East London, which isn't far from King Williamstown, which isn't far from uh, Middle Drift where Noni grew up. So being in the Eastern Cape and being a child of the Eastern Cape, I knew about the Jababus. I know that the family members here today who I met while I was growing up in East London, um, and so coming to find her books was also quite significant in the sense that it was purely by serendipity. Um, I was at a writing retreat where uh, there was a library at the monastery where I was having a writing retreat and I found one of her books. And perhaps just to read um, the author's note, which captures a lot of what has been said. So this is the author's note from Drawn in Color. You can still see all the notes that I made while I was doing the PhD, which I haven't removed. Um, where she begins by saying, I belong to two worlds with two loyalties, South Africa, where I was born, and England, where I was educated. Um, and she goes on to say right at the end, she's, to, to frame her memoir, she says, I have told here something of my own background and circumstances, since this is a personal account of an individual African's experiences and impressions of the differences between East and South Africa in their contact with Westernization. So what I find striking about um, Noni's life and the way that she frames her own story is a, a part of what Kosi said right at the beginning, how the world was at her doorstep. She is born into a vibrant and political, cultural, religious life, um, and she knows it. She knows it from a young age, and she knows it going into her adulthood, and this is reflected in her memoirs and in her writing. Um, I'm also struck by how Noni appears in the archive in the way that Charles and Sarah talk about it because she writes herself into that archive. For a long time, um, when I've been doing this work of trying to trace and find the, the, literary, um, the literary history of black women in particular, um, people like Kosi and I have always been in conversation about the erasure of people. And so what's striking for me is when we talk, when Kosi talks about um, you know, not being able to find anything on Google, that is a deliberate um, that is a deliberate set of decisions that have been made in spite of the fact that people like Noni write themselves into the archive. So when we talk about people not being in the archive, it's not so much that they aren't in the archive, it's that they haven't been put in the archive or they haven't had the opportunity to put themselves in that archive. And Noni's life, she does that in spite of the fact that she can't rely on the, the legacies of her grandparents or her parents or even um, the, the kind of social milieu that she was part of, but she actively 
um, preserves her stories through the memoirs, through the, the columns. And she's in, in fact quite prolific in being able to do that in spite of the fact that she also moves around. And I think this question of mobility is what also um, makes her quite a slippery figure. If you're moving around that much, it's difficult to kind of pinpoint you according to which archival you appear in. But because of Noni's life, she appears in many, many archives. Um, and today with the, the images and, and the narrative that Sarah shared, I was quite struck that the Mount School for Girls is very resonant with my own education as of a girls school in East London, Clarendon School for Girls, where I went for 12 years. Um, and in fact, it's the routines and even that image of the gym dresses. Um, and this is not to kind of uh, extend the parallels in any way, but to extract that the parallels, I thought, begin with, with you know, writing in the Daily Dispatch, but also this idea of girls' school education um, and what it meant, um, not only in, in York, but also those, how those residences find themselves in former colonies like South Africa, like a place like East London, which is still called East London, even though um, popularly it's known as Emondi. Um, and walking around in East London, you can see the colonial um, um, texture. Um, you will see the colonial texture in, in, in the school that I went to. Um, but I, I guess what, what, what is subliminal in all of that is the ability in which even going to the school that the, the kind of school that Noni went to and that, that, that um, Sarah so wonderfully described for us, that, that, that level of the, the, the questions of social justice and those Quaker values, um, how they influence Noni throughout her life in one sense, but how they uh, give us a different image of who Noni was and how she is quite firmly as, as she describes herself, both an African and British in that sense. And that it is difficult to, to want to pin her into one box. Because I think one of the, the challenges of Noni's um, representation or how we read Noni is that people want to kind of put her in a box or we want to put African writers in a box. And Noni seems to slip out of those boxes. Um, Charles mentioned Dennis Brutus. I came across a, a review that Dennis Brutus wrote about um, Noni Jababu in the 1960s, while well, a review of, of her book. And um, it's striking that um, someone like Dennis Brutus would have been a peer of sorts, but they wouldn't have been in the same sort of political circles. And for him, um, he represents Noni Jababu in quite a, a harsh way. Um, he says that she is a uh, 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 kind of the voice of the establishment in the body of an African woman. But I think what Noni does is to subvert those expectations for what she should be and who she should be. Um, and I think that's been the joy and the kind of unending, an, an, an unending story of, of, of Noni's life and writing is that she disrupts all those, um, she disrupts the need to put her into those categories. And in fact, I've recently learned that Noni's education in, 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 in York wasn't and is not uncharacteristic when we think of the Eastern Cape, when we think of institutions such as Lovedale, when we think of the many women before Noni um, who were educated abroad. So for example, while Noni's own mother was educated abroad, um, I've since discovered that there were at least five that I've come across so far um, and perhaps they, they are definitely more uh, black women from the 1800s who had, um, who had been educated in the UK um, and Scotland. Uh, Joe Davies does wonderful work um, on this in particular and has uncovered names such as, or women such as Notishi, Notishi and Francis Jubwana who were peers of Dio Soga who's more well known. Um, and there are more women such as Dina Denzana who went to Dollar Academy in Scotland um, and so there's, there's a legacy. So even while we see Noni and we see her story, I think it's important to see her story in the context of more stories and that her transnational experience um, begins with other women before her. And so if we only ever understand transnationalism through um, sort of the big men of history, there, uh, there's so much more evidence to suggest that this is not the case. Um, so perhaps I should stop there as well. Thanks. Thank you so much, Atambile. And, and all our speakers. And uh, we're now going to turn to some questions and some, some discussion in our closing um, quarter of an hour. 
And I think we're just going to get everyone on screen again. And we've had some questions come in and uh, lots, of, lots of interest in what everyone's been saying. Um, so please, if you'd like to add further questions, uh, feel free to do so in the Q&A. And um, just before we, I go on to pick out some questions, um, we should just take a moment uh, to remember Noni as, um, as the 18th of June was the anniversary of her death in, in 2008. So actually this, this event um, is, is very well timed just to, to recall um, a, a really full life and um, yes, so yeah, very poignant to be able to to meditate on on Noni today. And of course, it's um, just over a hundred years since since she was born, and her life traces so much over the long long twentieth century. Okay. I'm just going to dive into some questions. Um, we've got some, some, some specific questions around Noni's family and also her, her guardians, her foster, foster parents. So firstly, a question around, uh, was Noni's father at the University of Birmingham or at Woodbrook College in Birmingham, which was the or is, is the Quaker College that fostered international scholars. And Woodbrook was founded by Arnold Roundtree and members of the Cadbury family. Um, perhaps Kossi, do you, uh, would you be able to say a word about that? I don't know the specifics. I just know that he was in Birmingham. I don't know where exactly. Okay, so further work to be done. I think there's some thinking Catherine Hicks um, biography, and it looks like it was he went to Kingsmead, Kingsmead College. Um, but in 1913, the London meeting arranged for BDT to study for a diploma in education at the University of Birmingham. But I don't fully know whether he took took that up. But yeah, he was definitely at Kingsmead, uh, Kingsmead College, which had been established in 1905 by the Foreign Mission Association of the Society of Friends and was a missionary training college for Quakers and members of other denominations. So there's a, yes, there's obviously a lot going on in, in, in Birmingham, but whether the university was the validating body or he did another course, um, I don't know. But Catherine Hicks' um, book, The Ghost of Equality or the Public Lives of DDT Jabavu has, has more, more detail there. Thank you so much, Charles. And that the, the Birmingham connection is certainly an area to do some more work on. And uh, we have another question around her foster parents, um, the uh, Clarks and, and, and Gillets. When when did they when did they pass on? And did did she go to their their burial? And also a bit more about when her biological parents died. I can I can give the dates of um, Mary Clark died in 1962 um, and Arthur in 1964, but I don't know whether whether she attended the funerals um, uh, unless Cozy knows where she was in uh, in the sort of 60, 62 and 64. Her mother died in 1951. And her father, if I remember correctly, he died in 1959. And about going to the, the, the funeral of the foster parents, I'm not quite sure about that. Uh, but if it was in 62, she would have been in Jamaica. And at that time, she was with um, Michael Cadbury Crossfield as the husband. And from what I could work out, she was there until 1965. So both of them would have died when she was in Jamaica. Ah, oh, thanks very much, Corsi. Great, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, yes, there's so much more to, to be able to uh, talk about. Um, so 
yes, a question about wanting to know more about Noni's clan. And I'm just going to mention a couple of other questions at the same time. Um, uh, a question here around Dennis Brutus's criticisms, um, mentioning that the 1950s were, of course, a time of intense political protest, not just by activists like Brutus in the field of sports discrimination, but also the Federation of South African Women and the Defiance Campaign. So the question is, what was Noni's attitude to these vigorous movements? Um, maybe I'll take a stab. Um, the one about Noni's clan, I know that she was, um, and perhaps for those you don't know, clans are like family groupings. So um, you kind of have your your surname, um, and then you have your um, family name or grouping. And so her, uh, the Jababos were Jilis, um, and they came from the broader group of Amajili. And I forget Omagiwane, which um, clan they have. Um, but of course, Kosa culture, once there's marriage, it's patrilineal, so she would have been Umajili. Um, and Amajili came from the Magoma grouping of people as well. Um, and Magoma was one of the early um, resistors um, in the frontier wars. Um, in terms of, I think it's Peter's question about what was Noni's attitude to these vigorous movements. Um, my sense, and this was also partly in conversation with um, Professor Ndangela Masilela a few years ago, who had seen her in, uh, or while well, she was in Kenya, he was a young um, young man in Kenya at the time, and he gave me the impression that she was not really part of the political circles, I mean, politics with a capital letter P in the sense, um, and maybe Charles and Kossi could say more about that, but um, I think he, he said there was the impression that she was too English or presented herself as being very English, um, and so wasn't quite in those circles. In fact, I saw um, an extract that Kosi and I used for an, an essay that we've just written about her, that Brian also character, Brian Willen, um, who is so like his biographer and historian in the UK, characterizes her in the same way where he says she kind of falls out of the, the big and African nationalist movements. And she's partly because she's quite ahead of her times in the sense that those movements don't quite recognize or don't know what to do with a woman like Noni, who is quite independent, who is quite um, independently minded as well. And so she just doesn't fit into those narratives. Um, and so that's part of the reason I think there was tension with people like Masilela um, and even with her, her peers. And she, she falls out of that grouping, even while she's writing before there's um, the, the, the Heinemann African Writer Series, for example, that she is kind of rubbing up against all these men. They are all her contemporaries. And I think partly it's because those spaces were quite patriarchal in that sense. Thanks so much, Atambile. Did, did you want yeah. to chip in, Kosi? Yeah, I wanted. I, I agree with Atambile, but I also want to add a caveat about the fact that she was very clear about the fact that because she was writing her autobiography, she didn't want to say a lot. Okay, so she was working on it and the stories were going to be told there, which isn't to say she was in any of these movements. But what interested me with Charles's presentation earlier is that she gave this presentation at the United Nations mm -hmm. in 1950, what did you say, 1953? Because what I want to say about that is that coming from the kind of home that she came from, she was very politically aware. It's not that she did not understand the politics. Now, whether she chose to be active within a recognizable movement, we still don't know, but it looks like she didn't, which is very different from branding her as merely too English. She was an African who was aware of herself and understood politics. And the reason she couldn't come back to South Africa is because she was married to a, a, to a white man at that time. So there was a way in which, even if she would have tried racism, she couldn't escape it. So she, was, she had that political awareness and was talking about it to her friends in the private letters that she, she wrote. So if the question is about, did she have a membership card for a political organization? I don't think so. 
but she wasn't the English person that she's been branded as. Because when, 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 when black men that I have spoken to who are writers and her peers, when they use that language, there is the, the, the suggestion that she was too English to be political. And that's an incorrect, as far as I'm concerned, positioning of who she was. Yeah. And I just pick up on what Kosi said as well. I think she, she makes that quite clear in her memoirs, especially. I was trying to flick through because I wanted to read an extract. But in the second, um, in the second memoir, especially, I think for me, what I found quite striking is the way in which she weaves stories from the past. Um, so I, she, I know that she's part of the Jingli um, family, Jingli family clan in, in one sense, because she writes about it and she locates herself within that longer trajectory. So I think it's, 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 it's a misreading as Kosi says, and I'm, I'm glad she's kind of put it that way because she herself writes has her own story in relation to her own history. Um, and there's a beautiful description right at the beginning of the Oka people, I think, where she describes going to see her mother's grave, which is very much an African practice of going to see Abanda Batala and to go and see her mother, to see her brother, even after they've passed. So I think, yeah, it's, it's quite convenient to, to dismiss her in that way, even while her writing says otherwise, which tells us that they were probably not reading her writing or were reading it with a particular lens already. Excellent. Um, the organizers have granted us five more minutes because we've got uh, some um, a host of, of more questions here. So we'll we'll take a little bit more time. I'm going to move on now to pose a question um, that's come in around the role of the Quakers in bringing Noni to the UK and her attendance at two Quaker schools. Did she sustain her association with the Quakers for the rest of her life? Would, um, would one or more of you like to reflect on that? Do we, how, how much do we know? I remember reading about her talking about how Although she, she went to this Quaker school and her parents were Quakers and she had an association. I wish I had brought that, but she, she uses words to say she wasn't as committed even though she was associated and affiliated. I don't remember reading anywhere about the actual membership. Maybe it was there, but I don't remember finding it anywhere. So she doesn't deny the fact that she had an association but I remember reading her writing about not being as committed. She may have used other words, but that's the message that came out of there. Thanks, uh, Kosi. Yes, and uh, moving on now to a question around the availability of her memoirs today. Um, how do we get hold of Drawn in Colour and the Oka people? Um, I know you've mentioned um, sourcing your copies in, in, in libraries and in secondhand bookstores. And I know that's certainly what, what I've done as well. You know, how, how do interested readers uh, get hold of these books and what might be done to bring her more back into circulation or these, these two memoirs at least? Um, yeah, the, the Drawn in Colour and Oka people are not um, in circulation at the moment. I found my copies at an antique bookstore in Johannesburg as well. Um, but we have been in touch with the family um, to, to have that conversation about the reprints. Um, and I think it's, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, but I guess your festival will be the first to know. I know there are family members in the audience. Maybe if they would like to share, that would be um, their opportunity, and then I think it would be their story to tell. Um, but yeah, I, I think you know about the, the book of columns that Kosi and I were involved with trying to resuscitate the 1977 columns and put them into a book. So it's a work in progress. And I think because the, we just had the centenary two years ago, I think they, there's a, a growing interest. And so it's something that we're working on. 
fantastic. And we've got quite a few useful comments uh, come, come through. And uh, yes, a, a comment around, you know, just thanking um, Corsi for highlighting the issue related to structural insecurity in relation to, to Noni as a, as a young black South African woman um, mo yeah, coming to the UK and moving around in different parts of her life. Um, a comment here uh, from Peter Lim about fascinating aspects of Quaker history in places such as, as Craddock in the Eastern Cape, where but Mary Butler was active. So we can follow up on that lead. And um, from Linda Mvusi, uh, comments here about um, Noni's maternal grandfather being a founder of the ANC, and uh, that a part of the, the Makawani family um, who were a major political influence. So yes, uh, uh, lots of interesting discussion coming through in the uh, Q&A and uh, so much more for us to talk about. Um, I think we'll unfortunately have to move to to wrapping up, but this is you know just the one of me, just one of many kinds of for for fora where we can engage and um, uh, we will um, just move on to the last slide, which highlights two of the books that do relate to to Nani Jabavu, which um, Atambile has has already referenced. So um, the book around um, Noni's columns in the Daily Dispatch, um, which is called A Stranger at Home, uh, that will be out next year and uh, edited by uh, Corsi and Atambile. And also um, this uh, book, which we don't have a cover image for as yet, called Foundational African Writers one of whom is, is Noni Jabavu and um, alongside other, other black South African writers and, and um, leading political figures um, who, who all um, commemorated their, well, we, we, we recently commemorated their, their centenaries. So that will be out from Wits University Press also in 2022. And um, just on that, uh, while we, we have a moment, um, we should also just pay tribute to Professor Becca Seesweer Peterson, the lead editor of, of that volume and um, a leading light and um, mentor for many of us in, um, in a black intellectual scholarship. And um, we are very sad to have lost him this week, and uh, so we take we really want to pay tribute to his abiding influence, and his spirit, I believe, is, is with us today. And um, also, just to show um, uh, some contact details, I've just put up some contact details for Charles and myself. In in the first instance, if you do want to follow up on any questions, or make contact with any of the speakers. Um, and yes, we'd be very happy to, uh, to discuss any points that have come out of today. And there's also, I think you've raised, uh, the audience has raised many interesting points for us to think about and some, some good leads to follow up on as far as research is concerned. Um, just to ask if any of the, the speakers want to say any last, any last words. I think we're all, yes, we will take that as a chance just to thank you all very much for coming today. And uh, please let all your networks know that they are able to access this talk on YouTube. So thanks again, everyone. Goodbye.